Hello! In the last video we looked at the Hercules and CGA graphics modes of my PC1640, which is a very flexible graphics chip made by Paradise Systems integrated into its motherboard. This was required because the PC came with a choice of three different monitors, a monochrome one, a CGA one, or an EGA one. If you haven't seen the last video I recommend you watch it before this one, as it introduces some of the concepts we'll be expanding on in this video. A link to it can be found in the card above or in the video description below. But just to recap, in the last video we built a simple circuit to connect the PC and CGA mode to this G GBS8200 video upscaler, which lets us display the CGA output on a semi-modern VGA monitor. We then tested a few programs, namely PC Paintbrush, Monkey Island, Lemmings, Rambo 3, Iron Man Super Offroad, and Planet X3. Today though, we're going to move on to the EGA, or Enhanced Graphics Adapter, modes of the PC, which can display 64 different colours, and even has a high resolution 640x350 graphics mode, which is admittedly not quite as high as the Hercules mode we tested in the last video, but Hercules can't do 64 colours, can it? We'll begin by testing testing a low resolution 200 line mode. The EGA actually produces signals that are 100% CGA compatible in this mode, so you can actually use a CGA monitor on an EGA card, which is pretty cool. And even cooler, this means that we won't have to modify the converter circuit we built in the last video. However, this does mean that low resolution EGA programs are limited to the same 16 colours as CGA was, but unlike CGA it can use them all at the same time, instead of picking from four horrible predefined palettes. Just as an aside, I didn't initially realise that EGA low res used a CGA compatible output, and thought that the graphics chip in my PC was just broken because it wasn't producing the 64 colours. I ended up desoldering and replacing the chip with one I found on eBay, almost broke the PC in the process, and ended up just wasting a lot of my time and money. Ah well, you live and learn. So after setting up the PC's dip switches to EGA 200 line mode, I fired up Monkey Island and doesn't it look fantastic, especially when you compare it to the Hercules and CGA versions. Next let's try SimCity. We finally get to see it in pretty colours, although this is the lowest resolution mode the game supports. In fact, I imagine many fans of the game would prefer the black and white CGA mode we tested in the last video, as it's got twice the horizontal resolution. Rambo 3 looks much better, particularly in its depictions of Sylvester Stallone, which are practically photorealistic when compared to the nightmarish renderings in the Hercules and CGA modes. Iron Man Super Offroad looks great too, although to be fair its CGA mode wasn't too bad all things considered either. Planet X3 actually runs in a slightly odd 640x200 mode, and uses the graphics from the 320x200 VGA mode with a fancy dithering algorithm. This looks absolutely wonderful, and to be honest it's surreal seeing graphics this good come out of a pre-VGA PC. However, we've still only seen 16 of the 64 colours that EGA supports. To get the full colour range we'll have to build a new converter circuit. Now just to recap, the CGA circuit we've been using does three things. First it combines the horizontal and vertical sync signals into a single composite sync signal, in my case by using an exclusive NOR gate made out of four NOR gates in a single IC. Secondly, it converts the four digital video signals, namely red, green, blue and intensity, into three analogue signals, just red, green and blue. It does this using a simple resistor network. Finally, it deals with the special case where the dark yellow colour is actually supposed to be brown, by using a digital comparator IC to drop the level of green in the signal when it sees the signal combination for dark yellow. This allows the GBS to correctly display all 16 possible CGA colours at the standard resolutions of 320x200 and 640x200. Now the EGA supports 64 colours by basically expanding on the concept of the intensity signal, but instead of a single intensity signal, there is instead a separate intensity signal for each of the red, green and blue signals. This gives us two digital bits for each colour, a least significant bit and a most significant bit. This makes a total of six signals. To convert our CGA circuit to EGA, we could simply move the resistors going to the intensity pin to each colour's least significant bit instead. However, that means we won't be able to support CGA anymore. I decided to try and build one circuit that could handle both EGA and CGA using as few components as possible. Now going back to the CGA circuit requirements we mentioned earlier, our circuit still has to do all these things, plus support the additional per colour intensity signals required by EGA. EGA and CGA both use the same connector, but the pins do different things, so we need to be able to switch between the two different modes. One possible way would be to build a separate EGA digital to analog circuit, then have a switch to select between them, but that would require a three pole switch or maybe some kind of analog multiplexer IC or something. That's just adding more complexity. A more efficient approach would be to just use the EGA's digital to analog circuit and come up with some digital logic to convert the CGA signals to EGA first if needed. This means we only have to have one digital to analog circuit and we can just do the messy switching with digital logic, but what kind of logic? I suppose the traditional way to do this would be to build the whole thing out of discrete logic ICs, but we're trying to reduce the number of components here, not increase them, and the simplest possible design I could come up with would require at least four ICs. We could use programmable logic arrays to get the part count down to a single IC, but I didn't have any in my workshop, and I really wanted to get something simple up quickly. So let's go through some service manuals of EGA monitors for inspiration. 
The Amstrad EGA monitor that goes with this PC uses a lot of discrete logic ICs to convert the CGA signals to EGA. It's pretty inefficient in terms of part count, but at least we know that converting CGA to EGA is a viable approach. Next I looked at the original IBM 5154 EGA monitor. It again converts the CGA signals to EGA, but instead of using discrete logic ICs it uses a programmable ROM chip. This means that the IBM 5154 is doing all of its colour logic in a single IC, even the weird CGA edge case where the dark yellow colour is replaced with brown. This idea intrigued me. Now the principle behind using a ROM chip as a logic device is that you connect the logic inputs to the ROM chip's address lines and the logic outputs to the data lines. Then for each possible combination of address inputs, you program that address on the ROM chip with the combination of outputs you want. Ben Eater did a very interesting video on this topic which I'll link to below. I was really in love with IBM's idea of using a ROM, and if we use it in our circuit we've reduced the number of required ICs to just two, one ROM to do the colour logic and one XNOR gate to combine the vertical and horizontal syncs together into a composite sync. But can we go even further? It occurred to me that we could use the ROM to generate the composite sync signal as well. That would require nine address lines, six for the video signals, two for the sync signals, and one signal to switch between the EGA and CGA modes. I have plenty of these salvaged 27C010 EEPROMs lying around, which actually have 17 address lines, so they're very overkill. But who cares, this means that we can have a complete CGA and EGA converter solution that uses a single IC and half a dozen summing resistors. This is the entire schematic. Super efficient, huh? So how to program the ROM? Well firstly we need to calculate how many combinations of input values there are. We can do this by raising 2 to the power of the number of inputs, so that's 2 to the power of 9 or 512 different values. This will use less than 0.5% of the capacity of the EEPROM chip I chose. I made this Google Sheets document to calculate the values, I'll link to it in the video description. It starts with the ROM address, which represents the values of the logic inputs, and converts that to binary in separate cells for easier manipulation. There's the horizontal and vertical sync, followed by the colour signals, which have different functions depending on if we're in EGA or CGA mode, and finally the mode signal, which tells us which of these modes we're in. The next column is for handling the weird special CGA case where the ROM should be outputting the colour brown, and it's active when dark yellow colour is selected, i.e. when the red and green signals are high and the blue and intensity signals are low. The next set of columns represents the CGA input converted to EGA. The red and blue signals are very simple, the most significant bits are just fed straight through from their respective inputs, and the least significant bits are derived from the intensity input. The green signals work slightly differently if we are in brown mode. In this case, the most significant bit gets swapped to be the least significant bit, therefore reducing the amount of green in the signal and displaying brown instead of dark yellow. This set of columns represents the final output values. The first column is the composite sync signal and is generated by running the horizontal and vertical sync signals through an exclusive OR function. The next signal is simply the inverse of that, as I wanted to be able to experiment with different sync polarities. Finally, the last six columns are the final colour values. Depending on whether the mode bit is enabled, these columns are either copied from the CGA mode values in the previous column group, or just copied from the original inputs, which is required in CGA mode. The final column is the actual output value that will be stored at that address in the ROM. All we have to do now is program this table to the ROM chip. To make this easier, I wrote a super simple Google script to convert the output list to a binary file, and you access it from this menu marked Funky Stuff. When you click Convert to Binary, it creates a file called egadecoder.bin in your Google Drive that can then just be programmed straight to the ROM chip. I used this super cheap TL866 programmer to do the job. All that was left to do now is build the circuit, and I decided to solder it together on a proper piece of strip board because I was really getting sick of the mess of solderless breadboards I'd been using till now. As you can see, we have the 9-pin connector at one end that connects to the PC. The signals from this get fed into the ROM chip we just programmed, and the ROM chip outputs the six digital EGA signals to these summing resistors. The resistors convert the digital signals to analog, and then output them via this pin header at the end of the board. In addition to this, we have a switch to tell the ROM if we're in CGA or EGA mode, and another switch to invert the sync polarity, which I'll go into later. Finally, there's a USB connector to power the circuit. The ROM needs 5 volts, USB provides 5 volts, so it was a no-brainer. So after building the circuit, I tested it in CGA mode, and success! Everything works perfectly, even the brown colour is coming out correctly with no propagation delay issues. The colours look slightly more blurry than before, however, I suspect because there's no buffering on the ROM's outputs, but I'm very happy with it for now. Switching to EGA mode clearly does something with the colours, but we'll need some software that supports all 64 EGA colours to test this properly. Now remember I said earlier that most low resolution EGA programs were limited to the basic CGA 16 colours? Well there are some exceptions to this rule. As it turns out, EGA graphics cards are perfectly capable of outputting the full 64 colours in low resolution mode, but most EGA monitors, including the original IBM 5154, will just ignore these extra colours. This is presumably because IBM wanted people to be able to use EGA graphics adapters with older 
EGA monitors. Now the way that EGA graphics cards are supposed to tell the monitor to go into 64 color mode is by inverting the vertical sync signal. The vertical sync signal normally looks like this yellow line, where it's low most of the time, but it goes high during the vertical blanking period. In 64 color high resolution mode, however, it does the opposite. It's high most of the time and low during V-blank. Auto-switching EGA monitors, including the original IBM 5154 and the Amstrad PC ECD, used a sync polarity detecting circuit like this to determine what mode it should be in. It really couldn't be simpler, it basically just uses a resistor and capacitor to filter out the V-blank pulses, then if the output is high it switches to 64 colour mode. Unfortunately this means that they can only be in 64 colour mode when the vertical sync is normally high, and vertical sync is always normally low in low resolution, so these monitors can only do 16 colours in low resolution mode. However, some third-party EGA monitors such as the NEC Multisync 2 had a physical manual switch that can force the monitor into 64 colour mode. This means that they're capable of displaying 64 colours in low resolution, and a very small number of programs were written with these monitors in mind. Of course, thanks to our fancy circuit, we can just switch between 16 and 64 colour modes anytime we want, so let's put it into 64 colour mode and have a play with these special low-res programs. Of course PC Paintbrush supports these modes, because it supports bloody everything. Here I have my scope hooked up to the two red signals, and you can see as I change the background colour through different levels of red, it goes through the four combinations of the two signals in turn, so we're definitely outputting 64 colours. Also note that H-Sync is normally low, so as I said earlier this mode wouldn't work on an auto-switching EGA monitor. One game that supports these modes is Iron Man Super Offroad, which asks you if you have a switchable 64 colour monitor on startup. As you can see by comparing it to the 16 colour version, it has a much less garish colour palette in this mode. The other game that we've been testing that supports 64 colour low res mode is Rambo 3, but it does it in a very strange way. On startup, instead of saying it requires a switchable monitor, it instead requires a Paradise graphics card, which luckily this PC has. However, looking at the scope traces, it correctly inverts the vertical sync signal, so in theory Rambo 3 should be able to trick standard EGA monitors into displaying low res 64 colours, which is pretty cool. Even more strangely, the horizontal sync frequency is increased slightly to 17.8 kHz, which is probably still in the acceptable range for EGA monitors. I can only assume that this is some weird mode that only works on Paradise graphics cards, and wasn't available on standard EGA cards, but if anybody knows more about this, give me a shout. Anyway, in 64 colour mode there actually seems to be less colour detail in certain parts of the screen, like in these enemies. Oh well. I guess all there is to do now is investigate the high resolution mode. Now, unfortunately, the GPS doesn't support horizontal frequencies much higher than 15 kHz, so 21 kHz high resolution EGA mode is out of the question. Or is it? You see, 15 kHz is a limitation of the GBS's firmware, not a hardware one. The TVIA chip at the heart of the GBS is perfectly capable of syncing to a 21 kHz signal, just the somewhat basic firmware on the GBS board isn't set up for it. Luckily, one very clever human being known as Rama has deciphered the somewhat inadequate leaked documentation and written code to control the TVIA chip with many more options than the default firmware. He released it as the GBS Control Project, which runs on one of these ESP8266 boards. To use it, you simply download the GBS Control code to the board and then connect it to the GBS. This adds a so-called medium resolution mode and will allow it to sync to 21kHz EGA signals. So I switched my PC to high res EGA mode, powered it on and success! We're getting lovely high resolution text, although not quite as good as the Hercules. The video is a bit unstable, but it's good enough to test a few programs with, so let's get on with it. As is tradition, we'll start with PC Paintbrush. Even though it calls it 16 color mode, it does in fact support all 64 colors at the lovely high resolution of 640x350. SimCity's high resolution EGA mode is probably the best way to play the game, since it's almost as high res as the Hercules mode and it's in full color. Isn't that just delightful? Now, Lemming's EGA mode is high resolution, but only for the menu screens. This means that even though the game itself is in low resolution, annoyingly you can't play it in EGA mode on a low res CGA monitor since you can't get to the menu screens. I guess you could try and navigate the menus blind, but it really does seem like a weird oversight. Anyway, it does look great even though this is technically low resolution mode. If you have a manual switching EGA monitor, as I basically do, you have to remember to switch it between 16 and 64 colour every time you start and finish a level. So I guess that's all the video modes the graphics chip in this PC supports, but there's nothing stopping us adding a VGA graphics card and getting even more video modes. Now, VGA extends the number of available colours again by using 6 bits for each colour instead of the 2 used by EGA. This gives us 64 levels for each colour, and therefore 262,144 possible colours, although it can only use 250 six of these at any one time. The VGA used analog output instead of digital, and of course used the standard VGA connector, so we don't need the GPS at all anymore. Here's a VGA card I picked up cheap on eBay. 
When attempting to install the card, we immediately notice a problem. The card edge connector is physically too large for the ISA slot on the motherboard. This is because the slots on the PC1640, like the original IBM XT, are 8-bit and this card is 16-bit. But I decided to plug it in just for fun and after connecting it to my monitor, to my surprise it booted up perfectly. It showed the expected VGA BIOS messages in the lovely high-resolution VGA text mode. So let's see what this thing can do. Unfortunately, the 8086 processor in the 1640 was pretty outdated by the time the VGA came out, so an awful lot of applications that support VGA require a 286 or a 386, but most of the apps we've been playing with earlier have VGA modes that will work perfectly. PC Paintbrush of course supports a number of different VGA modes. The first one we're going to try is the low-res 256 colour mode, which as you can see supports setting the brightness of each colour through lots of different values instead of the four that EGA supported. It also supports higher resolutions than EGA, here it is running in 640x480 for example. The VGA was actually capable of doing screen resolutions up to 800x600, although most monitors of the time either struggled or outright refused to sync to such a high resolution signal. There is even talk of such modes damaging monitors or causing them to emit high levels of X-ray radiation, but I don't know how true any of that is. Anyway, I'm running an LCD monitor so I'm probably okay. FractInt is one program capable of displaying these higher screen resolutions, although I couldn't get any of my LCD monitors to sync at the full 800x600. My 1080p Dell monitor managed 768x576 though. Anyway, onto some games. The Lemmings VGA title screen certainly seems to be using more colours than it was before, but as far as I can tell, the actual game still uses the same 16 colour artwork as the EGA version. The ability to pick these 16 colours from a much wider range makes the colours go together in a much more pleasing fashion, however. Similarly, Super Off-Road still uses 16 colours, but interestingly runs at a higher frame rate on the VGA, about 20 hertz versus 17 for EGA and 13 for CGA. I know that the VGA has a number of hardware features that speed up screen drawing, but I didn't expect it to make any difference on a processor as old as this. Rambo, on the other hand, seems to be making full use of the 256 colour mode to add extra detail to the graphics. I've seen better looking VGA games, but it's clearly better than the EGA modes. We don't get any frame rate improvements here, however. Planet X3 also uses 256 colours and looks just wonderful, although we've actually seen these graphics in the dithered EGA version. It's lovely to see them in their natural form though. Most VGA games still only ran at the same 320x200 resolution as CGA and EGA games did, but SimCity is a notable exception, running at 640x480, finally a mode that beats the Hercules monochrome. Given the choice though, I think I'd rather sacrifice a bit of vertical resolution and play the full colour EGA mode. So is that it for our graphics adventure? Not quite, how about multiple graphics cards? You see, it turns out that even PCs this old actually support having multiple graphics cards working simultaneously. One of the cards needs to be an MDA or Hercules, and the other should be a CGA, EGA or VGA. Now unfortunately, using the VGA together with the PC's internal adapter didn't even boot. I imagine because even in Hercules mode it still has some of its EGA parts enabled and they're getting into a fight with the VGA card. So I disabled the internal graphics entirely, grabbed a cheap Hercules clone card from eBay, slotted it in right next to the VGA card and plugged the original Amstrad monitor into it. This booted like a charm and I was able to switch between the monitors by using the MS-DOS mode command. Now that's all very well and good, but why would you want to do this? Well perhaps the most common use was for software development. For example, the Borland C++ development environment made very good use of multiple monitors. Perhaps you would edit your game's code on a nice high resolution monochrome display and have the game you're developing run on the lower resolution colour display. Or here's the way I'm using it, I've got the debugger running on the VGA display and can single step through the program listing while watching the program's output on the monochrome monitor. This is a massively useful thing to be able to do for any programmer and it was very common for software developers to install MD or Hercules cards in their PCs for this purpose even in the late 90s. Funnily enough, this means that there are now four graphics adapters in this PC. There's the two graphics cards we added, the now disabled Paradise EGA internal graphics adapter, and most bizarrely of all, a completely disabled Amstrad CGA graphics chip that's a legacy component from the PC1640's predecessor, the PC1512. When they added the Paradise chip to the 1640, I'm not sure why they chose to leave the vestigial CGA chip in, but I expect that some of the PC's glue logic was integrated into the CGA chip, and it was just more economical to reuse the existing chips than have entirely new ones designed. Anyway, sorry we ended up getting a bit off track there. I maybe should have split the dual monitor stuff into another video, but I didn't really think there was enough material to warrant it. If you're still watching after all that, then thanks very much. Please like and subscribe, and stay tuned for the next episode. I plan to perhaps install a sound card, or maybe Windows, or possibly even upgrade the processor. Who knows, maybe all three. Catch you next time.